Ryan Hartz, it's your old pal Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said great. We're going to have a great vlog today because I have mentioned this to a friend of mine for about two years and we've never been able to set it up, but today we're going to do it. My friend Earl Skakel has quite an interesting story. He was born and raised out here in Los Angeles. He, um, his mother, her, si no, no, his father's sister was Ethel Kennedy, who was married to Bobby Kennedy. Uh, Earl grew up in Bel Air. His next door neighbor was OJ Simpson. And at one time, Earl was dating the manager of Motorhead. And so Earl was in the Motorhead world and had to take Lemmy on quite a few excursions, help him out quite a bit, and has quite a few stories. So since a lot of people over time have said, hey, can you do something on Lemmy? We all love Lemmy. Everybody in rock and roll, I think, loves Ian Lemmy Kilmeister. The guy was great in Hawkwind. He was really, really famous for Motorhead. But I think more than anything, anyone that ever knew anything about Lemmy was more blown away just by him being him. So today we're going to talk about the great Lemmy Kilmeister. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. In today's vlog will be a Patreon sunglass vlog for Richard Bruner Smith. Hope you enjoy the history of Lemmy. All right, I just got some mail that I ordered. I recently saw an interview with a guy that I used to watch in a lot of movies, and he had a tracheotomy because of lung cancer, and he recently wrote a book, so I bought it from this place because they always have signed copies of the book, well, certain titles, for the same price that you would pay for the book new anyway, so I just paid the $30 for this from them. Yep. The autobiography, or the memoir, of Val Kilmer. Been in everything. <laughs> There's his signature. Looks pretty cool, huh? The gang's all here already. Well, it's interesting. One of the last times we were here, I just bragged about how all the dogs are so well behaved and everything. And then I went walking up this dirt path up here. A couple of dogs started barking at me and one of them bit my ankle. And the owner just sat there and did nothing. Gotta love LA. So Lemmy was raised in North Wales, fell in love with music even from a young age. And as he said, he could remember the days before rock and roll when little Richard, Elvis, and Jerry Lee Lewis came out, he said the world never looked back and he got all into rock and roll. Said he would go to a local furniture store and would have to ask the guy there to place orders for him to get records and eventually joined a band, he was clean cut in those days, called the Vickers and when you couldn't get anyone to let him play, he would be a roadie. So that's originally how he made his way into the Vickers was being a roadie. He also was a roadie for Jimi Hendrix at one point. Lemmy once made a funny comment. He said, Jimmy didn't really like to do a lot of drugs despite what people think, but he did like to do acid. And he said, you know, they said you couldn't do acid two days in a row, but Jimmy proved him wrong. You could if you doubled the dosage. Lemmy eventually joined a band that I really loved called Hawkwind. It was kind of this psychedelic rock band and they used to go all out. He said they would play long, long songs and he said he can remember gigs where they would lock the doors behind the people so that they couldn't get out. And this was one of those things that became legendary. They played loud and when Lemmy eventually formed Motorhead, which would basically be what most people knew him for, they would go on to be one of the loudest rock bands in the world actually not one of they were named the Guinness Book of World Records loudest band in the world and for a big part of Lemmy's rock and roll life he lived out here in Los Angeles in the same apartment so today we're gonna go by see Lemmy's apartment we're gonna see where Lemmy used to hang out and where Lemmy is buried well actually where Lemmy's ashes are laid to rest because he was cremated everybody's against me today dog was barking at me, but now those two became friends. Maybe Jock can put in a good word for me. 
Now Lemmy's style is pretty unmistakable. Though he started out a guitar player, he said he was never really that great of a guitar player. There was always a better guitar player around than him, so he gravitated towards playing bass where you had an easier chance of getting in a band. However, he never really learned how to play the bass properly or not with your fingers or anything like that, so he played the bass kind of like a guitar. He kind of strummed it and because of that, it definitely developed its own sound and when you hear someone play like that, you, they always kind of call it the Lemmy style. Metallica has joked about that because Metallica, everyone in that band, they were huge Motorhead fans. In fact, Lars has said that uh, Lemmy is one of his idols and that Motorhead's his favorite band and James Hetfield said that he got a lot of his phrasing especially early on and his look with the chops and the facial hair and everything from Lemmy. Earl kind of lives over here by Lemmy. You can see they boarded up the Hornberg Jaguar place. They weren't taking any chances. Hey, there's Freddie Mercury and that guitar over there. There's a win. Some of the uh, shops over here by the Viper Room are boarded up. And the Hustler store. So down this little dead end street, right down at the end, was where Lemmy lived for decades. So right here at the Hera Towers was where Lemmy lived and he literally lived right there. Apartment 24. Now one of the things he said was he'd never move because he said he would never find a rent controlled apartment close to the Sunset Strip or close to the Rainbow, his favorite hangout. So he just lived there for decades upon decades. And my friend Earl here had the pleasure of knowing Lemmy pretty well. So you can actually see the apartment right over Earl's head. Now, Earl, how did you come to know Lemmy and how well did you know Lemmy? I knew him very well. I was dating the manager of Motorhead. There's two managers, Shelly and Todd. I was dating Shelly. Not that there would be anything wrong with dating Todd, but I don't fly that way. And uh, so since I live right down the street, they would ask me to check up on Lemmy at times because Lemmy would go off the grid for a few days. And since I was local and they both live far away. I was the guy tasked with coming over here, make sure he was okay. And it really scared me to do that because I didn't want to be the guy who found him dead. Because uh, he had a lot of vices, didn't he? He had a lot. Uh, well, really not that many. I, I take that back. He had like two or three, but they would kill an oh. elephant. So. Right. A lot of guys said that, you know, Lemmy, they never, as much as he did, they never saw him inebriated or, uh, or like, too screwed up to perform or anything. No, he was like a marathon runner. He had built up such a tolerance to drugs that his doctor at one point told him, don't stop. Because in Lemmy's mind, the speed and whatever else he was doing was regulating his body. And, and he was uh, diabetic also, wasn't he? Yeah, he, was, he uh, this shows you where his mindset was. He stopped doing whiskey, drinking whiskey and switched to vodka for health reasons. Uh, wow. So I had to come over here many times just to make sure he wasn't dead. And almost every time he'd be at the pool with a black stripper, just sunbathing in his famous jean dolphin shorts. And he would look up at me and go, I'm okay, Earl. And then uh, probably the funniest thing is one time they were on tour. You know, they made most of their money on t-shirt sales and tours, not necessarily their music. You know, it's just the way it works. And they toured a lot. I mean, they were always on tour almost every year, weren't they? I would say 10 months out of the year. Because they did like festivals in Europe and, and beyond. They're kind of like a, I mean this in a complimentary way, a B version of Iron Maiden, who Iron Maiden America does okay, but in Argentina and the UK, they sell out football stadiums. But Motorhead's really considered almost like the foundation of heavy metal, wouldn't you say? Well, I mean, absolutely. they go back that far. I mean, uh, Megadeth, Metallica, they all say they wouldn't be doing it in, unless Motorhead had paved the way. So uh, I, I'm, they're on tour somewhere in, the, I think, it was UK, and uh, Shelly said, hey, you gotta go get Lemmy's mail. I'm like, well, where's the key? It's like, well, you have the key to the apartment. Just go in the top dresser drawer in the living room. So I go over there, you know, and it, the documentary doesn't do 
that place justice. It, you couldn't see the carpet. There was so much. Shit. He said he had more stuff in his apartment than most museums he had been to. Well, absolutely, he had uh, a couple bases. Not as many bases as you as you'd think. Uh, probably hundreds of the t-shirts, all black, all cut off at the sleeves. Um, Lots of military stuff. Wasn't he obsessed with military history? Nazi history. He wasn't a Nazi. He was just fascinated by the occult of it. Uh, so yeah. Was, I think he had Hitler's China or something, his knives or something. And then uh, there was so much. You go in the kitchen, it was like, it's undescribed. Oh, man, I heard on the documentary, the guys who made the documentary said they, they had to talk Lemmy into letting them film him making fries, chips. Yeah. And then they said when we came over, he didn't want to do it once we got over here, so we had to spend an hour talking him into it. Then he didn't want us to do it because the kitchen was so filthy, so we had to spend two hours cleaning his kitchen to get him to make that. And he goes, then we only used 10 seconds of it. And then Lemmy spent the hour afterward telling us that it was stupid to even film it. Well, I, I mean, I would have to water his plants and it would take me probably an hour. Now he only has a two bedroom in there. I still talk about him like he's alive. And there were so many plants and, and potholes and nooks and crannies where there'd be a little pot, potted plant behind a computer that hadn't been turned on in 30 years. And uh, so I go to get the mailbox key. I open up the top dresser drawer. Hundreds of Polaroids fall out. And I wasn't really paying attention because this place, I mean, I loved him, but he kind of creeped me out, that place. Not him, but he was place. just his own guy. Like it, it, from the style, the way he was, just everything about him. You take a band like Kiss, it's probably my favorite band. They change styles constantly. Disco is popular, they did a disco album. The Cars were popular, they put out a Cars type album. Motorhead put out the same, literally the same album every two years. They just didn't care. This is who we are. You like the music, great. If not, go listen to the Village People. Uh, so I'm starting to put all these Polaroids back and I'm not really looking. And keep it somewhat clean if you can. I will. <laughs> and I'm like, I look at one and it's like, uh, let's just say a black female uh, giving Lemmy oral copulation. And I look at another picture and it's a different female doing the same thing. And then I look at another one, it's the same thing. I'm like, Jesus Christ. And then I start to look at the picture and I'm like, I'm standing in the spot where all these pictures were taken. And then I, 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 it's like a fog of war. I freeze and then I start looking around and there's like three cameras on tripods pointed right where I'm standing. And uh, I was like, I gotta get out of here and get this mail. That's kind of Lemmy in a nutshell. And he says in the documentary, cause like you said, he had a pretty big collection of Nazi memorabilia. You said people often ask or, or would accuse him of being racist. He said, well, all of my girlfriends, my last six or seven have all been black women. So yeah, he was the furthest thing from race. Yeah, no, he, people have to understand that Lemmy was just, he loved the style of that military dress so that's what he would have his the guy who created his boots and everything he would have him create that stuff and he would hand draw ideas and take it to the guy to make his wardrobe that's how into it lemmy was it was very well read so he just was fascinated by the subject yeah actually i had heard that he would watch documentaries and then argue with the documentaries and go get books out to prove that he was right on dates that they got wrong or, or airplanes that were supposedly in one war that weren't even created yet. So he, he was a very interesting guy, but you actually had to help run errands with him. Didn't you say you had to take him to the dentist one time? Yeah, I took him a couple times. My dentist is in Westwood, which is, uh, I don't know, three or four miles west of uh, where we are now. And I pick him up on, right there at nine in the morning once, right to probably where this blue car is. He gets in the car, he's like, can we go to Turner's Liquor, which is on Sunset in Doheny. And I'm like, uh, yeah, sure. What do you want from there at nine in the morning? He's like, oh, just a couple beers, mate. And uh, so I go in there and uh, with him and I buy like an energy drink for me. And he buys these gigantic Foster's lagers. Like, they're, they're not cans of beer, they're like miniature kegs. And uh, he opens one up in my car. And you know, in Los Angeles, you're not really supposed to drink in your car have an open container and then he opens up the second one and he hands it to me and I'm like oh I don't drink I've never had a drop in my life he's like well you should start and uh, by the time we got to Westwood which is literally a five minute drive both beers were finished that's amazing by I, him. I had heard well you see in the documentary there's I forget who it is telling the story but says I think it was Mike Inez he says they're um, they're sitting down let me says you want to have a drink and then he opens up a Jack Daniels hands it to him 
Mike drinks it, passes it to the next guy, he drinks it, and then he says, and then Lemmy's opening up two more bottles to give to us three, meaning he thought we were gonna drink one bottle each. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, his level of drinking is beyond anyone's that I've ever met, and I know some pretty severe drinkers, like, you know, he would start his day with like a shot and a beer, like just to get it going. Like where I would drink an energy drink, you would maybe have orange juice or whatever. You know, he, he would literally start drinking the second he got up. Now, Lemmy had one place that he really hung out here in Los Angeles. They, they always say if he wasn't on tour, he's at this place and it was just a few blocks away. So we should go over to the Rainbow Bar and Grill. They probably still are saving his seat. His seat at the Rainbow Bar and Grill is so iconic. No one sits there. Like everyone knows it's Lemmy's Deep. Even teenagers who go there, who have no idea who Motorhead is, they, even they know, oh, we can't sit there. And they now have a Lemmy statue there, so hopefully we'll be able to see that as well. Yeah, I was there the night they did the whole reveal, and uh, it's scary. The, the statue looks like him. And if we're lucky, we'll get to see the trivia machine that Lemmy was always playing. It said Lemmy was always kind to any fans or anyone that came up, wanted to picture anything, but then he got back to business and got back to the trivia. And there's his apartment. It was apartment 24 if you watch. There's a lot of documentaries on Motorhead and Lemmy, but he participated in one in 2015 called Lemmy. And that's the one I had seen about two years ago. And they show him inside this apartment with just stuff all over the place. Lots of tribute stuff, things that fans had made him, porcelain figures of him, and lots and lots of military regalia. And in the documentary, they show him coming out of his apartment, walking down the stairs, and then passing a woman as he walks through these doors. So I'll just kind of show you the doors that he would have passed through for over three decades. And those would have been where he got his mail. His apartment was just to the right. So if you're leaving Lemmy Street, you make a left, one block, you're right up here at sunset, and just to the left is the Roxy and the Rainbow. So here it is, the famous Rainbow Bar and Grill. Lemmy always used to drive his car up, park it right over here by the mural of Lemmy. We were actually just here for the Cheech and Chong vlog. But here's the mural of Lemmy, and it's pretty much right directly across from where he used to sit, because the bar is right over here and Lemmy used to sit right at the end of the bar where that trivia machine is. So here we have a great picture of Lemmy and up here. This is all to Lemmy and then here's his statue right in here. How cool is that? They've got the mask covering his face right now but that's so cool. Look at the doorway that takes you up the back stairs. It's all Lemmy, and that's his seat. He used to always sit there playing that machine. She's gonna take the mask down for us. There it is. And they even call the back part Lemmy's Lounge. So this is kind of cool right here in Lemmy's seat. They actually have a plaque for him. All right, now we're gonna head out of here. We're gonna go see Lemmy's final resting place. And then over here on their brick section, you can see they have a motorhead brick. And then this is the billboard before you walk in to the main entrance. So right now we're heading to Forest Lawn Hollywood Hills. So Lemmy's pretty easy to find. You enter this section where Betty Davis is right over here. And you follow these tiers a few levels back. So you get to the very back. Now once you get back here, that one in the corner is Ronnie James Dio, and Lemmy is right over here. 
in this room to the right. Columbarium of Sacred Trust. Looks like they're about to have a service, so we won't stay long, but as soon as you walk in, right on the bottom, Ian Fraser, let me kill mister. Born to lose, live to win, with his signature and the ace of spades. And a lot of guitar picks. <laughs> Lemmy passed away at the age of 70, four days after his 70th birthday, and two days after he found out he was terminally ill. So sad. He actually died of a couple of different things. Look, there's some lipstick prints. I want to leave a pic as well. So the pic that I brought him, if you can see it, says on it, Francis. And the reason that I have this is because when I went to see Kiss and I got to go backstage, Paul Stanley's Guitar Tech gave me a handful of Kiss picks, and this was in there. This is his band, this is his pick, and he's one of the most rock and roll people I've ever met. So when I knew I was coming today, I thought, yeah, let's leave him a Francis pick. The official cause of death for Lemmy was listed as prostate cancer, cardiac arrhythmia, and congestive heart failure. He lived it all and did it all. Rest in peace, Lemmy. And here's Ronnie James Dio. Like I mentioned. Man on the Silver Mountain. And looking over at Lemmy's columbarium over here from where Dio is buried. And we walked in through this entrance over here. All right, my friends, we're gonna call it a night. I hope you enjoyed this vlog, and I hope you enjoyed hearing some firsthand stories from Earl about Lemmy. He is a total rock legend, and unfortunately, I never got to see Motorhead. The only time I saw Lemmy was when he performed at Dave Grohl's birthday party, and Dave Grohl introduced him as the greatest living rock musician. And I would have to agree with that. Hope you guys enjoyed hearing about him if this was the first time you've heard of him. Hope you want to explore a little of his history. Go check out Ace of Spades, of course, and Damage Case. Those are great. Thank you, Brendan Castle, Johanna Bustamento, Angie Dehone LaForest, Paul Lemoyne, Tommy O'Neill, Al Delgado, Angela Chapman, R. Monty, Tammy Mullins, Sandy Johnson, Ralph No, Daryl Marbley, Jimmy Beasley, and Amber and Mikey for becoming my newest Patreons. And Richard, I hope you enjoyed this vlog. Have a great night, everyone, and goodbye.